Hi there, I'm Abdurrahim Mimouni. Welcome to this video about educational psychology. The content of this video is based on Robert Slavin's course book, Educational Psychology, Theory and Practice. In this video, we're going to focus on chapter one. This chapter serves as an introduction to educational psychology. It mainly handles these three questions. First, what makes a good teacher? What is the role of research in educational psychology? And finally, how to become an intentional teacher. A good question to start with is, what is educational psychology? Educational psychology is commonly defined as a scientific discipline of the development, evolution, and application of principles and theories of human learning. In other words, educational psychology is the study and application of psychology theories and concepts in educational settings. As a teacher, educational psychology can help you understand principles of learning and provide you with the information you need to become an effective teacher. To describe how educational psychology can guide your actions as a teacher, I borrowed in this video the concepts of reflection in action and reflection on action from Sean's reflective practice framework. Here, educational psychology can help teachers reflect in action in the sense that it provides them with the learning theories and principles to make good decisions while teaching in the classroom. For instance, when a student misbehaves in the classroom, the teacher can use their knowledge about educational psychology in order to make a good decision to handle the misbehavior. Educational psychology can also guide teachers' reflection on action as it gives them the language to discuss their experience and thinking. This means it can help teachers reflect on the decision they make and the way they teach as well. The first question of this chapter is what makes a good teacher? Is it their sense of humor? Is it their ability to care about students and value their diversity? Or is it their attitude toward the job? Or is it their hard work? Or is it their enthusiasm? Or is it just because they give good grades? Of course, throughout your learning journey at primary school, middle school, and high school, you've been taught by a number of teachers and have made judgments about which ones were good and which ones were not. Before we start talking about the attributes of good teachers in this video, I would like you to pause the video now and think of the criteria you have always used to evaluate your teachers. These are some characteristics of good and effective teachers. Good teachers know the subject they teach, master teaching skills, are intentional teachers, and they use the 21st century skills. So what does each of these mean? Well, let's see. The first thing a teacher must have is some knowledge or skills that the learner does not have. Therefore, you as a teacher should master the subject you plan to teach. In this regard, I like this quote by Albert Einstein. If you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it. This quote implies that your mastery of a subject depends on your ability to explain it and put it in a language that is simple for the learner to understand. So knowledge of a subject matter is important, but alone is not enough to help learners learn. Good teachers are the ones who know the subject they teach and can explain it and communicate it to their students. To teach someone or to explain something to someone, you need effective instruction or pedagogy. Effective instruction is not a simple matter of one person with more knowledge transmitting that knowledge to another. Effective instruction requires carrying out other tasks motivating students, managing the classroom, assessing prior knowledge, taking into account the characteristics of learners, communicating ideas effectively, 
reviewing information, and assessing learning outcomes. Can good teaching be taught? The answer is absolutely yes. It is true some people seem to have naturally the charisma to gain students' attention and respect. That's why some people think that good teachers are born that way. Yet, good teaching can be taught. Good teaching has to be observed and practiced. These are the major components of effective instruction according to Slavin. As you can see from this figure, good teaching is decision-making. The ability to make good decisions depends on your knowledge of subject and teaching resources. It depends on your critical thinking and problem-solving skills. Good teaching requires self-knowledge and self-regulation, knowledge of students and their learning as well. Teaching is all about reflection. As a teacher, you have to reflect on your actions and teach students how to reflect on their own. Good teachers are good communicators. Communication skills play a critical role in effective instruction. Good teachers get their message across and help their students to communicate effectively. Last but not least, good teaching is informed and guided by research. Effective teachers always use research for their professional development. There is no magic recipe for being a good teacher. Teaching is about planning and preparation. Teaching is about aligning all the teaching strategies and assessment techniques and practices with the outcomes you want your students to achieve. Good teachers are intentional in the sense that they always plan things and do things for a reason on purpose. Another attribute of good teachers is self-efficacy. That is the belief that what you do as a teacher contributes and shapes your student learning. Good teachers can use the 21st century skills. These are collaboration, which means working together to reach a goal using individual talents and knowledge. Digital literacy, that is using technology to assess and evaluate and create information. Communication, the ability to share thoughts, questions and ideas. Creativity, trying new approaches to get things done. Career skills, such as flexibility, initiative, self-control, leadership. Good teachers are good critical thinkers. They use sound reasoning, make complex choices, make connections. Last, good teaching is all about problem solving. That is looking at problems in a new way, using learning to solve problems. Another important question of this chapter is what is the role of research in educational psychology? As I explained before, educational psychology is the scientific discipline that studies systematically principles and theories of human learning. It sits, therefore, to help practicing teachers understand their students and the way they learn effectively. We can say, therefore, that educational psychology provides teachers with principles and theories to apply in their classroom in order to improve their instruction and respond to their students' learning. Educational psychology examines the obvious and least than obvious questions, using objective methods to test ideas about the factors that contribute to learning. Research in educational psychology yields a set of principles laws and theories. A principle explains the relationship between factors, such as the effect of alternative grading systems on student motivation. Laws are simply principles that have been thoroughly tested and found to apply in a wide variety of situations. And the theory is a set of related principles and laws that explains a broad aspect of learning, behavior, or another area of interest. The value of research is crystal clear in the classroom. Let us consider this situation. You teach a group of students and you turn to write on the board and one of your students makes a paper airplane and flies it across the room and the entire class laughs. What would you do in this situation? What decision you would make? As a teacher, 
you may consider various options. You may decide to reprimand the student, ignore the student, send him to the office, or tell the class that it's every, everybody's responsibility to maintain a good learning environment and that if a student misbehaves, five minutes will be subtracted from recess. You may also explain to the class that the student's behavior is interfering with lessons that all students need to know and that his behavior goes against the rules of the class. Each of these actions has a theory behind. A reprimand is a form of punishment. The students will behave to avoid punishment. Attention may be rewarding to the student. Ignoring him would deprive him of this reward. Being sent to the office is punishing. It also deprives the students of the apparent support of his classmates. The student is misbehaving to get his classmates' attention. If the whole class loses out when he misbehaves, the class will keep him in line. The class holds standards of behavior that conflict with both the student's behavior in class and the class reactions to it. By reminding the class of its own needs, that is of course to learn the lesson and its own rules that are set at the beginning of the year, the teacher might make the student see that the class does not really support his behavior. So now, which of these theories is correct? In this situation, the student seeks the attention of his classmate. So if you reprimand him, you might reward him with what he wants, the attention of his peers. Ignoring misbehavior would work if the students were acting up to get your attention. But in this case, you're not apparently the target. Option three might seem practical, as it deprives the students of his classmates' attention and therefore might, might be effective. However, it might be rewarding for a student who looks for ways to get out of class to avoid work. You may have had classmates of this kind at school, or you yourself have acted that way. I personally have. Option 4. Making the entire class pay for each student's behavior can work, as the students would not approve their classmates' behavior. But it would be unfair to punish students for something they did not do. The last option, reminding the class of the goal of learning and why they are in the class and what is expected of them might work if the class does in fact value academic achievement and good behavior. Research in education and psychology has a lot to say about the decision you would make in this situation. Developmental research explained that students at adolescence value their peer group and try to establish their independence from adult control, often by breaking rules. Behavioral learning theories provide information on how to punish or reward for behavior. Research on classroom management strategies explains how to prevent and react to misbehavior. Finally, research on rule setting and classroom standard indicates that involving students in sitting rules can increase academic achievement and appropriate behavior. Research in educational psychology can therefore help you understand the student's behavior and choose a response to deal with situations like this one. As I have just explained, research in educational psychology provides you with the information to help you make good decisions. However, there is no theory, no research, no book that can tell you what to do in a given situation. Making the right decision depends on a lot of factors, such as the context of the problem, the objectives you have in mind. Therefore, besides research, you need to use common sense. Whether teachers are aware or not of the impact of research in educational psychology on their practices, it does have a significant impact on educational practice. Such impact is reflected in educational policies, professional development programs, and teaching materials. The last
The last question of this chapter is how to become an intentional teacher. Before you become an intentional teacher, you have to become a certified teacher. In Morocco, there are a lot of ways to get certified. You can join CERIMEF, you can get a professional BA in teaching, or receive a training and certificate from a private institution. For most of these, you have to graduate from university. Talk with experienced teachers in your school, observe them teaching, ask them to observe you and share ideas. Take advantage of every opportunity to take part in all sorts of professional development workshops for teachers on a wide range of topics. Talk to your colleagues, your former classmates, your friends who teach, even your friends who do not teach. Share your success, your failure, and your questions. Do a lot of reading. Read teacher-oriented journals, magazines, publications, and join teachers' associations. Do whatever it takes to help your students learn. And always remember, we don't learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. End of chapter. Thank you for watching. Thank you.